Now that we have most of our participants in the room, we, we will make a start. Um, our first presenter this morning is Dr. Rosmar Maracano of MSD Animal Health. Dr. Rosmar has been a vet for 20 years. She has a master's in pathology. She's a Venezuelan professor as well. And she's the poultry technical manager of the Caribbean for MSD. Uh, her topic this morning is optimal vaccination programs in the first 15 days post-hatch. Doc. First, I want to thank you to the CPA for the invitation and a special thank you for Chris Wilson to help me with my visa and for Ryan Serrat. So, here are the topics we are going to speak about. It's a brief introduction, then we are going to the vaccination, which are the program vaccinations we have, the recombinant vaccines, how can we evaluate these vaccination programs, and finally the conclusions. So first, we have this little guy. This is where we start. We have this chick that is in the hatchery and it's going to the farm. And we have to consider which are the factors we need to know to raise this chick. So first, we have the environment. We have it's all what surrounds that chicken. And here we are going to consider what's the macro and the micro environment we have, like the climatic condition, the epidemiological disease in the zones, the poultry population we have in that zone. Second, we have the biosecurity. It's all the measures we take where before, during, and after we have to raise that chick from the hatchery since it goes to the field and they are pulled out. Then we have the management. It's all the things we do inside the farm and we have to do to raise that chicken and get the better performance of them. And finally, but not least, we have the feeding. And it's very important we give all the requirements to these chicks to they have the expression of the best potential genetic they have. So how we get the disease inside our flocks? First, we have the, what we call the stressor factors. We have main stressor factors, several stressor factors, okay? But one of them, and very important, is the exposure to the pathogens, okay? So which is the field challenge we have? We have to know this. But other things we have is the inadequate nutrition, the, the, the environment we have, the temperature, the cold, the humidity, okay? So when this disease is spread. So when we have control of this, let me see if I can do it this way, okay. Stressor factors, we have it in the low, okay. There we are going to have healthy flux, but with these stressor factors come to medium and high. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. yeah, better. <laughs> And when these factors go to the medium and the high level, we are going to see the expression of the disease in the subclinical way and in the clinical way. But we have some measures we can take to get this disease out of the flux. The first thing is we have to do is decrease the exposure of the animals to the pathogens. We do that by the biosecurity. Then we can decrease the susceptible of these animals to the disease and we do it by the nutrition and the management. And finally, we have to increase the resistance to the disease, and that's why we do with the vaccination. Other factors we can consider is this two lists, but most important of this is the low maternal antibody and the early change that we have to the field, to the virus field. Okay, the high density of poultry, the failure in vaccinations, and the deficit of the immune system. Vaccination, well, we all know or have familiar with the vaccination process, but which is the principal object we have with the vaccination is to reduce the level of the clinical disease and promote the optimal performance of those slugs. Okay, so we have different types of vaccines. First of all, we have the live vaccines that are attenuated or modified. Then we have the inactivated or killed vaccines. And finally, we have the recommended vaccines that are the last technology we have in the vaccination programs. 
And we have different virus we can use or different type of vaccines, like the Marek virus vaccines. We have vaccines for Newcastle, Gumboro, laryngotracheitis, and Newcastle, Gumboro. And in the fall pox virus, we have AE and ND, and finally we have the adenovirus. So, vaccination progress. How can we do a good vaccination program? We have different factors that we have to consider to get a very good vaccination program for our flocks. We don't have a general vaccination program that you can apply in all the flocks because one flock is different from the other one and one farm is different from the other one, okay? So, one of the main things we have to consider and sometimes we don't pay attention to this is the levels of maternal antibodies we have in those flocks. Most of the country have their eggs from the USA and they hatch the, the eggs here and get the births. So sometimes we don't really know which is the vaccination program of those breeders. So it's very important to you to know which is the level of these maternal antibodies. What is the function of these maternal antibodies? They protect when they are very high titles in the, in the birds, they have a metabolism. That's very important we know that they are not going to endure all the, the time the flock is in the field. So here we have a, a rule, it's not uh, strict, but you can see that the decline of the maternal antibodies for the birds is the half each 3.5 .5 days. Okay, for the broiler breed it's 4.5, and for the layers, the most long is 5.5. For example, if we have a very good maternal antibodies for IBD, it could protect the animal for two or three weeks before uh, the infection increase. So here's a graphic we can see. This is a maternal antibody where the chick is born and after one to three weeks, they start to decrease. And it's very important that we know when they are going down, in the first, in the second, or in the third week. And here's an example, just to know. Here we have two cases. It's one case where the breeders are from a young flock, and they have very good titles and uniform titles. So you see that the protection is almost until the 18 days old. But when you have a <coughs> an even flock, sorry, an even maternal antibodies and an old flock, you see that the protection is least into 19, nine and 12 days. So this is one of the things we have to consider to get a very good vaccination program for our flocks. So here's an example. Like I say, it's not a strict. You don't have to put it all the time in the same time. But here's an example of a vaccination program you can have. Depending on the antibody, maternal antibodies you have, you can have one vaccine in the day one, live vaccine for Gumboro, for Newcastle, or for Newcastle bronchitis. And then in the field, we have the seven, between the seven and the eight days, live vaccine for Newcastle and Gumboro, and in 14 days, a live vaccine for Gumboro. This depends on which is the field challenge we have, okay? Sometimes we have more field challenge with Gumboro, sometimes we have more field challenge with Newcastle. So it depends on the zone where the farm is and which is the challenge, the main challenge you have in that moment. So here's the vaccination in the hatchery. By spray, we have the manual machine and the automatic machine and then you have this uh, red color on the, on the chicks and you see that it's a very good vaccination. In the field, the most uh, common way you can vaccinate the birds is by drinking water, okay? And here are very important things that we have to take care. There are some ten details we have to consider in the hour we are going to make a vaccination in the water. And here's a list, but the, for me, more, more than the most important thing is which is the water quality and this, the water volume you are going to use because depending on the age of the chick, you have to use different volumes of water. So here's 
some rules. You see, maybe in for 1,000 chicks at seven days, you can use 10 liters of water. And for the spray vaccination, the drop has, be, has to have a size between eight, 80 and 20 micron, micrometers, okay? The important thing is once we prepare the vaccine, you have to get the less time to get that vaccine for the birds. It's very important that that time is around one hour, one hour, 15, so much, okay? Because after that, that vaccine is going to start to die because it's a live virus or a live bacteria. And here's the spray vaccination in the field. It's very important that you take care of the size of the drop you are going using. Okay, that's the conventional way we have to the vaccination and it's one of the most common we have. But now we have the innovation to produce more. So as the technology has every year some things new, the vaccination is going on in that way too. So for that, we have what we call the recombinant vaccines. And which is that? It's a vaccine that use a virus or a bacteria that we are going to call the vector or the carrier, okay? And that's going to transport the gene that codes one of the immunity of the disease we want to get, okay? So they are called the recombinant DNA vaccines. And one of the things they have is they combine, they combine the security of the inactivate vaccine with the efficiency of the attenuate live vaccines. How we made this is vaccines. It's not, we are not going to be the genetic engineers, but it's just a brief review of how these vaccines is do. Okay? First of all, we have the components. We have to, to, to take, see which are the virus we are going to use, which part of those virus we are going to have, the construction and the expression. First of all, we have the marrow virus. Well, Today we are going to talk about the last recombinant we have in the market, that's the HVT and the IBD, okay? For this, the, this vaccine, we have first the Marek virus, that's the carrier or the vector, and it's choose because it's a big virus and it has a long chain of DNA. Then we have the Newcastle virus, which it has all these proteins in the structure, but for us, the important is the F protein or the fusion protein. That's the one that's attached to the, mem the, to the cellular membranes. And finally, we have the Gomboro virus, which for us is the important, the VP2. That is the one that the protective antibodies are located in this gene. So how we get the expression of this F and BP2 protein. First, we have the gene F, that's one that's going to express the F protein. And for the Gomboro virus, we have the BP2 gene, which expresses the BP2 protein. And then we, we get those two genes, we replicate it, and we are going to construct a dual cassette that is this, what we have here. We have the BP2 gene protein and the F protein. And this is what we are going to insert in the DNA of the mammaric virus. Here's a, a, a picture where you can see this is a mammaric virus, the two genes we replicate in, and then finally we have this molecular. This is the mammaric virus with the expression of the F protein and the VP2 protein. So here we have the vaccine that protects us for the Marek disease, for the Newcastle disease, and for the Gumboro disease. How it works. Okay, so here we go that the first we have to vaccinate the chicks. We have two ways. We, we can vaccinate the eggs in the hatchery at the 18 days, and we can vaccinate the chicks in the first day old. Okay? The important thing, and very uh, carefully with this, is extra important to ensure that every chick 
or every hatching egg is properly vaccinated because this vaccine cannot spread bird to bird in the field. So when you have this vaccination in the, in the hatchery, you have to be very careful of the person that's putting on that vaccine in those chicks or in the eggs in the machine, okay? Then inside this va uh, vaccine is going to replicate in fact, the T and the B cells, and they are going to start to express the proteins for the HVT, F, and VP2 protein. The immune system reacts, and it is going to start to make antibodies for these three proteins. And finally, we have the protection with the antibodies F protein for the challenge for Newcastle, and the VP2 protein for the challenge for Gumboro. Okay, so once it's inside the bird, they stimulate the immune system, they try, start to produce the F and BP2 antibodies. And these antibodies, when they are exposed to the virus of Newcastle and the virus of Gumboro, they attach to those receptors. And then when they get to the avian cell, they cannot be attached. Okay? So that's the way we protect from the exposure to the field virus, which is the advantage we have with this use of these vaccines. First, we are introducing a dual recombinant vaccine, which is called HVT and DIBD. It's a unique three in one vaccine, and we have more control of this disease. It has a very superior long-term uh, protection for these three disease. It reduces the use of antibiotics, so we are reducing the medication cost. We have healthy birds and more productive returns of the invest and the profits, and this way we can access new markets. And one of the things that's very important, we want to give the message, it's this, this dual recombinant HVT and the IBD vaccine, it's very safety because they eliminate the post-vaccination reaction. They don't spread the virus of Newcastle and Gumboro. They eliminate the possibility of latency. They eliminate the interference with the maternal antibodies and the interference with the respiratory vaccines, okay? So here's a graphic where we can see that for Marex, we have around more than 87% of protection at the nine, nine days, nine days, sorry, of age. And for IBD, we start to get a 90% of protection at the two weeks. And for the four week, we have the 100% of protection. And for Newcastle, it's the one that's more delay, but it starts 90% at the four weeks. So how can we use this vaccine? As I say before, we have two methods. We have the in vaccination, where we have to consider, like Dr. Gary said yesterday, which is the egg quality we are going to have of those eggs to be vaccinated, okay? And then we have the subcutaneous vaccination the day old. They have baby chicks with the have this list of quality, but very important, they are very healthy to get that vaccination. This is what we need to do that vaccination. This is the vaccine, the implements, the diluents, and all the things. It's important that we review all the machines are working very good, the, the size of the needles, and the position we use to vaccinate those chicks. The persons that do that vaccination and finally, we have the evidence of that vaccine is given to each sick. So how we construct the vaccination programs when we use a recombinant vaccine? Here we have, we can use it, the excellent disease protection, and we can use it combined with the RISPRIN and the SV1 strain, the protection to Newcastle and the protection to Gumboro. So this is the idle scenario we had to have. We have the chicks that they have high titles of maternal antibodies. 
okay, that protect those animals until the third week, between the second and the third week. And that's the time that get enough time to the vaccinate, to the recombinant vaccine to express the 100% of its efficiency, okay? So we have here the maternal antibodies. Here's where the vac recombinant vaccine has this 100%. So you have a very close window here for the field challenge. The other scenario we have, mm -mm -mm. okay, when we have poor maternal antibodies, okay? So what, which is the picture? These poor maternal antibodies, they have a protection until one, maybe two weeks, and the, the recombinant vaccines start to get the 100% around the third weeks. So here we have a very open window and we have the high risk to get a field challenge in that moment. So what we can, what we can do in these cases? In these cases, we can make the recombinant vaccine with a live vaccine in the hatchery the first day. Which are the exceptional cases? We can recommend this combination of the recombinant vaccine with the live vaccines when we have immunosuppressed birds, when we have challenged very early in the, or there are endemic areas for some disease like Gumboro or Newcastle, and we have cha high challenge after an outbreak. So this is the way it's going. So we combine the maternal antibodies that are low with the live vaccine, and they have this protection for these three weeks, and then the recombinant vaccines start to act and the 100%. Which are the critical points we have to take care of when we have a vaccination, even if it's in the field or in the hatchery? First of all, the method, the vaccine application. We have to very, very carefully which is the method we are using, and we do that about doing the audit. How is the vaccine preserved? How is the application? Which are the implements we are using to apply? to apply that vaccine. For the live vaccine is which is the strain we are going to use depending on the field challenge we have in that moment, the management of those vaccines, the application methods, and the schedule of vaccination. And finally, we have to consider always which is the exposure we have to the immunosuppressive disease, okay? Like Umboro, Marek, anemia, anemia. How can we know these vaccines are working for us? Of course, you are going to see the animals in the fields and you see if they are going to get the disease or not. For the other way, maybe you don't have the disease, but you want to know if you are going to have the enough protection for those chicks. So how can we evaluate this? The first thing we can do is the microscopic aspect of the immune organs the thymus, the spleen, and the bursa. We have the serologies and we have the histopathology. So here, we have a very good develop of the thymus with good size and good color. Here we have a bursa and a spleen with a good relationship. Here's the bursa inside and with it's important now is not just the size of that bursa we have now, it's important what we have inside that birth, okay? Maybe it's a, a, we have the idea that maybe more big is better, but sometimes it's not the rule. So in these times and for the use of this different vaccination programs, we have to see is not only the size of a birth, it's what we have inside the birth, okay? So if you have maybe a birth size four or size six, five, five, sorry, but inside is this way, we have a good develop of the, of the falls. We don't have edema, we don't have hemorrhage. It's considered a very good bursa. And the other thing, you have to relationship with this if you don't have any disease in the field, okay? Here's another good relationship between the bursa and the spleen. This is a very good bursa with the falls very developed very clear, and here's another one. And for the other side, in the respiratory system, one of the things we 
evaluate and it's very good to see is how is the condition of the air sacs, okay? So when you have this kind of air sacs, they are very clean, they are very transparent, that's why we want to get in those birds. We have the histopathology that, of course, gives good information on how is those organs inside and which is the population of those immune organs we have for the lymphocytes. And finally, the serology. It's a very useful tool. We have to get improve, uh, the, the time to use it all the time, okay? Because it gives very good information for us and it's the, like see the, uh, the x-rays of what you have in the farm, okay? So it's very important that you have to consider doing the basal lane of your company in base of the serology and this, good, this give us a very good information of what you have and which is your main challenge and the moment you have the challenge. How can we evaluate the recombinant vaccines? We have the, all this, these three methods, the macroscopic aspect, the serology, and the stupidology. But finally, we have this new tool that is called Veriflex. And Veriflex is something that's created with the new technology, and it's like an FTA card that has a code bar. But this has three Vs that we consider important. The first we can do here is give the vaccine when we give the uh, HVT vector vaccine to the flock, then we have to know if that vaccine is getting to the, to the birds. And that's why we have the second V that's verified. This is a test that you can see when you send the sample of the spleen or from the feather uh, pulp to see the replication of that recombinant vaccine. And finally, we can use it too to evaluate other disease and see which are the channels we have in that moment. So, just for now, it's very easy. You have the, the chicks, you take the samples, here's the FTA card with the cold bar. Then, with the application you have in the phone, you send that information to the lab. They receive the information, they process the four cycles they have. Here is the presence of the vaccine, the HVT and the IBD, and they finally have detect the genetic markers we have for the VP2 and the F protein. So we can difference the HVT vector vaccine for no vector vaccine and for a normal vaccine. So after this, uh, Speak. The idea is to give the message that either you have a conventional or a new vaccination program, it's very important that you be very careful with the details of the application of that vaccine. Sometimes we have the idea that we give the vaccine and we don't do anymore, okay? So the idea is that we have uh, interaction of different factors vaccination, environment, management, feeding, that we had to take care of all these details and have the best expression of those animals in the field. And for final, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. That's for something for Socrates. And the idea of this is that every day you learn something is a day you approach very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. Um, just a few takeaways from that. Um, one is identify the diseases that are prevalent in the country. Make sure when you identify that, you find the right vaccines for the job. Make sure you do the vaccination properly, and then make sure you test that it's being done properly. A lot of times in the Caribbean, both hatcheries and farmers decide what they want to do. Most times they decide, I don't need a vaccine. And that just basically makes a mess for the whole country, not just your operation. And we need to be more serious about the way we identify 
and go through the process of vaccination. Sometimes vaccine seems to be expensive, but it's more expensive if you don't use them properly. Next up, next up is Dr. Ivanio and Dr. Waldron. Dr. Ivanio, most of you would have been introduced to Dr. Ivanio yesterday, but uh, for those who have not been introduced to him, Dr. Ivanio is from Brazil. He's uh, attached as a poultry specialist with the Polynutri uh, Concentrate Company in Sao Paulo. Uh, Dr. Ivanio is extremely uh, talented in his field. He has worked in all over Brazil, but mainly in hot, humid uh, areas of the Northeast. And uh, he is here with us to share his experiences with poultry performances in different housing types. With him is Dr. Waldron, Dr. Nicholas Waldron, who is Guyanese, and he will help to interpret for him. Good morning. Uh, vou contar novamente com a, com a ajuda de Dr. Nicholas para fazer a, a, a transmissão. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, same arrangement like yesterday. He'll be dependent on my help to translate for you. E vamos falar um pouco hoje a respeito de performance é, em aviários de diferentes tipos mm -hmm. dentro da, da, da criação de frangos. Today we we'll look at different housing types in raising chickens. Falar um pouquinho do Brasil. É, o Brasil é um país continental com diversidades de climas em, em regiões que temos climas do norte e nordeste, que são climas quentes, o nordeste com clima quente e seco, o norte com clima quente e úmido, o centro-oeste do país com, com condições climáticas é, no inverno de clima frio e seco e no verão de clima é, chuvoso e quente. Então, há uma diversidade muito grande no clima do Brasil. Então, é, para cada região, há necessidade de adaptação das instalações, de equipamentos, para que tenhamos um bons resultados. Um, a little background on Brazil. Brazil is a large uh, continental country with, with various regions. For example, there's the north and the northeast, which are both hot, but the northeast is hot and dry, while the north is hot and west. The cent central east of the country um, has cold, dry winters and hot, wet summers. So for each reason, you have to adapt in terms of the installations you build and the equipment you use. A região sul do país, como tem uma diversidade de clima maior, onde o período de inverno é muito frio e seco. Mm -hmm. The south is a bit different from the rest of the country in that um, during the winter it's very cold and dry. E o verão é quente e úmido, há uma necessidade é, de melhorias dos tipos de equipamento. Ocorreu, é, um, é uma região é, de, de equipamentos de maior tecnologia. All right. Um, so it, it, calls, it calls for a great amount of adaptation and, and technology in terms of equipment you use and the installations. É onde temos é, 40% de, de aviários do tipo de pressão negativa, 40% de galpões abertos e um pouco de galpões de pressão positiva. Então, mm -hmm. so the south and southeast of the country, about 40% of the houses are negative pressure, 40% open, open-sided, and 20% positive pressure. A região nordeste, que tem um clima quente e mais seco, é, há uma concentração maior de aviários de pressão positiva, onde as instalações são dotadas de ventiladores, de nebulizadores, é uma boa parte forradas. Mm -hmm. So, while in the north, where it's hot and dry, you have a much larger percentage of positive pressure houses, and they depend heavily on fans and nebulizers to maintain temperature. Já a região norte, que é uma condição climática quente e úmida, 
é, tem se destacado a, a, a utilização de equipamentos do tipo de pressão negativa, onde você consegue controlar é, desde o início a temperatura, a ventilação e a umidade dessas instalações. While up north where it's hot and humid, from the very start of the crop, um, you depend on negative pressure to control the ventilation, temperature and humidity. Foi criado há não sei quantos anos atrás um, um método de mensurar a eficiência de, da criação dentro da, da empresa e comparativo com as demais empresas. Uh -huh. Many, many years ago, um, this index was developed to measure the performance of, of the birds. Um, could be used on individual farms or in a cooperative to assess the performance of, of various farms within that cooperative chamado Índice de Performance, ou Índice de, de Produtividade Europeu, e ele envolve toda a, a cadeia produtiva, desde genética, nutrição, sanidade, o, o meio ambiente, o manejo dessa ave. É um índice europeu, e ele considera todos os aspectos da produção, desde a genética, até o ganho e o ganho, e tudo está construído na fórmula onde todos esses fatores estão relacionados ou correlacionados com a mortalidade, com o ganho de peso do frango, com o fator de conversão alimentar, para que se obtenha o resultado final. E todos esses fatores de produção são correlados com a mortalidade, a rate de conversão e o ganho de peso, para que se obtenha o final de performance index. Acho que é um índice conhecido de todos, onde... É, nós temos a viabilidade, que leva em consideração quantas aves que morreram no plantel, é, o ganho de peso, que leva em consideração a idade e o peso médio atingido por essa ave, dividido pela conversão alimentar, que leva em consideração o quanto foi consumido de ração pelo peso obtido no final. Então, so it considers your, your mortality, your weight gain compared to age, and um, that's divided by a feed conversion. É, é um índice que valoriza muito a, a conversão alimentar, porque todos os índices de viabilidade de peso são multiplicados em cima e depois dividido por essa conversão uhum. alimentar. Então uhum. é um fator que pesa muito neste resultado é a conversão alimentar. Because you divide by a feed conversion, the indice, um, this index, sorry. Pays a lot of stress on feed conversion, um, and you, the performance of your farm is really judged by the feed conversion. É um índice técnico que não leva em consideração a parte econômica. Já existem outros índices que é, beneficiam um pouco mais ao uh -huh. produtor de saber a condição econômica do resultado. Então, como é somente um índice técnico, é, comparativo entre propriedades, às vezes você tem uma propriedade que tem um índice de eficiência maior, mas o custo de produção daquele frango foi maior também. Então, a parte econômica, às vezes, não vincula bem com esse índice. Um, it's for the greater part, part a more technical um, indication of your performance, not so much an economic indication. Um, oh. okay. Bom, é, subdividimos a apresentação com base nos cinco pilares da, da avicultura, que são a genética, a nutrição, a sanidade, o manejo e a parte de meio ambiente. Uh -huh. e, the presentation is divided according to these five pillars of production, um, genetics, nutrition, health, management, and environment. A parte do meio ambiente subdividimos nas instalações, equipamentos e qualidade do ar, e essa qualidade do ar na temperatura, na ventilação e na umidade que são os responsáveis por, por essa ambiência dentro do aviário. The environment is further subdivided into installations, equipment, and air quality, and air quality for the subdivided into temperature, ventilation, and humidity. Guardando um ali, tentando focar ali o telefone dele. Bom, Bom a, a genética é, é um fator fundamental dentro da nossa criação. Né? Tem trazido é, melhorias 
na agricultura, impressionante, lote a lote, ano a ano. So genetics is one of the key things in poultry production, and we've been making gains in this area, batch to batch, year to year. A nutrição acompanha, ou tenta acompanhar essa genética também, é, fazendo uma nutrição de precisão, uma nutrição bastante especializada para se conseguir é, eficiência dentro desta genética. So nutrition is now forced to keep up with this high level of genetics we have, and it's becoming more and more precise um, in order for us to get the best results from, from our chicks. Os laboratórios, como acabamos de ver, têm desenvolvido tecnologias de vacinas, vacinas recombinantes, é, engenharia genética nas vacinas, para cada vez fazer com que tenhamos uma ave é, com melhor resposta imunitária, com melhor segurança de saúde. The labs of well, as well have been keeping up with um, technology, as we saw in the last presentation, um, recombinant vaccines, genetic engineering, to help us uh, have a bird that is um, more and more res immune responsive to the challenges they meet in the field. As instalações, a, a, a criação dentro da granja cada vez tem especializado com treinamentos é, da equipe e técnicas para melhorar a, os desafios, a pressão sanitária dentro dos aviários, mm -hmm. com criações tudo dentro, tudo fora. Mm -hmm. The installations as well uh, play a very important role in, in the whole production cycle. Um, the right type of equipment, right type of installations, easier to sanitize and to keep clean and, and to manage. Tecnologias de equipamentos, cada vez mais novos equipamentos vão surgindo para auxiliar neste processo. Então, todos os cuidados dentro do aviário, é, independente do sistema que esteja trabalhando, são necessários. Cuidados com recebimento do pinto, com distribuição de equipamento, com monitoramento do, do ambiente e com a, a panha e transporte deste frango para o abate. Yeah. Irrespective of all these technological developments, um, new equipment helping to make your job easier, regardless of the farm or the type of farm you have, Management is still important. You still need to be observant, take all the care in receiving the chicks, um, water quality, feed, etc. Preocupação muito grande sempre. Ontem falamos a respeito de espaçamento para o pintinho. É, é necessário que se dê espaço rápido para este pinto desenvolver, para que ele não fique sob uma cama umedecida, para que ele tenha uma temperatura de pé e complementando a temperatura de corpo, é eficiente para que desenvolva bem. One of the big concerns for management is that the chicks should always have sufficient space um, so that the litter never gets too wet and too damp and uncomfortable for the chicks. So we, we should always have a program of opening up the, the brooder um, as fast as possible to ensure that the chicks have sufficient space. Desculpa. Só um pouquinho. Boa distribuição de equipamento, toda a, o cuidado de manejo interno com temperaturas e tudo. Pode repetir? O controle de distribuição de equipamentos, do manejo interno, de aquecimento, todo ele é significativo para que a gente tenha um bom gerenciamento final do, da ave. Né? Yeah. The amount and the distribution of equipment, um, provision of sufficient feed, good quality, Water quality, everything plays a part in ensuring that we have good production. Tudo isso independe do tipo de instalações, do tipo de aviários, mas é, toda essa conjuntura é preciso de se ter o cuidado em todos eles. This has, regardless of the, the type of facilities you have, it's the same sort of care and attention you have to give to the, to the birds. Então, dentro daquela divisão, a gente, em termos de qualidade de ar, é, ontem falamos a respeito da criação dos primeiros 15 dias, onde o pintinho tem necessidade de um aquecimento, na maioria das vezes, em climas, às vezes, muito quentes, tem necessidade até de um controle diferenciado, mas na maioria da, das regiões há necessidade de um aquecimento do pinto na fase inicial. E nessa fase final há necessidade de resfriamento das instalações. Então, quanto mais oscilação de temperatura nós temos, no, no ambiente, mas tem que ter tecnologias para amenizar este processo. Uh -huh. 
Um, we saw yesterday that in most cases, during the first 15 days, there is a need, even in, even in these warm climates, to heat the, to, to heat the baby birds, to provide heat for the baby birds. Coming to the end of the cycle, it's the opposite. We need to cool them down. And this could be a challenge um, in our type of climate sometimes. Então, dentro das diversos tipos de instalações, é possível criar adaptando, é, pegando os desafios que se tem e fazer as adaptações que sejam necessárias para melhorar esta condição ambiental. So, um, considering the different types of conditions and installations you might have, we need to identify what the challenges are and adapt so that we could provide the best environment possible for the birds. Mesma coisa, uh, dentro das instalações, a preocupação é com temperatura, umidade, ventilação, a qualidade do ar, e cada tipo de instalação vai oferecer uma condição para que a gente consiga eh, manejar essa, este pinto. Um, the environment inside each type of, of pen varies in terms of air quality, temperature, ventilation. We have to identify what is needed to be done and do it to ensure the birds are comfortable. E para cada melhoria dessas instalações, os custos acabam sendo maiores os investimentos, né? Mm -hmm. yeah, if improving the, the 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 technology or the level of the housing you have could be very costly. Estas fotos são da região norte do país, na região aqui de de de, de Manaus, Amazonas, é, clima extremamente quente e umidade extremamente elevada e as instalações, mais de 60% ou 70% das instalações são de pressão negativa. Ok. Por exemplo, no norte do Brasil, onde é muito hot e muito humid, around 70% of, of the pens are negative pressure. Bom, também tipos de, de instalações. A parte de ambiência e de controle de ar, é, já comentamos ontem a importância da retirada deste gás de amônia dentro do galpão, que são extremamente tóxicos, traz problemas é, respiratórios, problemas cardíacos, problemas oculares. Então, a necessidade de renovação deste ar é muito importante. Hum. Yes, we spoke about air quality and the need to remove toxic gases like ammonia from the pen um, to avoid for the problems um, with respiration. Bom, subdividimos, são várias classificações que tem, mas colocamos três divisões mais simples entre a ventilação natural, a ventilação com pressão positiva e os galpões com pressão é, negativa, mm -hmm. né? Cada um com a sua tecnologia. Yeah. There are various classifications for um, housing types, but to make it easy, we'll put them in three broad categories um, related to the type of ventilation, natural ventilation, positive pressure, and negative pressure. Obviamente, com toda a tecnologia de genética, de nutrição, é, a ave do passado não é a mesma ave de hoje. Mm -hmm. Então, as instalações precisam de ser é, remodeladas, precisam de ser construídas novas instalações que faz com que dê essa condição ambiental para o pinto com melhor facilidade. Né? Because um, of all the improvements in genetics and nutrition and all of that, obviously the bird that we used to rear before is not the same as the bird today. So our um, infrastructure too has to adapt to accommodate this, this new bird. O frango responde pelo aquilo que ele recebe de volta. Não adianta nós queremos é, colocar uma, um, um, um frango de alta capacidade de crescimento dentro de uma instalações, não darmos as condições satisfatórias para ele e esperarmos no resultado final é, bons resultados. Né? The bird responds to what it receives, so it doesn't make sense putting a bird with a high um, growth potential into infrastructure that cannot support that sort of growth. You wouldn't get the results you're looking for. Apenas um demonstrativo, a, a tabela está em português, mas o doutor pode auxiliar, é o que podemos esperar de algumas melhorias entre um sistema convencional e um sistema de pressão negativa, onde podemos ter uma densidade maior de aves pra, por metro quadrado. Uhum. E apologize for the table being in português, um, but what it shows 
is the, the type of improvement you could expect <clears throat> by um, improving the, the type of infrastructure you have. The columns is the conventional system, negative pressure, and negative pressure dark house. Sorry? Uh -huh. um, the first row is stocking density. The second is a uh, livability factor in percent. Um, then you have daily weight gain, feed conversion. Okay, EFP. Um, the performance in the sea and the cost per kilo of live bird in real. So your stocking density on a conventional system is 31 birds, 31 kilograms per meter square. If you improve to negative pressure pens, you could stock at 37. If you used dark house, you could stock at 38 kilograms per meter square. Um, the livability factor is in, re is in reference to the conventional system. So in negative pressure, you, could stock, you, you have a livability 1% higher than conventional, and in dark house, 2% higher. A daily weight gain in reference to conventional system on the negative pressure, you have 0.5 of a, percent, 0.5 of a gram more and for dark house, you have one gram more in daily weight gain. Feed conversion, um, in terms of grams of weight per thousand grams of feed, compared to conventional system, it's minus 50 grams, and dark house minus 100 grams. Your performance index, is plus 15 points compared to the conventional system in negative pressure and plus 30 points, double in dark house. And your production cost per gram of live chicken is minus 2% compared to the conventional system and minus 4% in dark house. Thank you. Devemos sempre lembrar que a criação de aves é uma biologia, não é uma matemática. Então, são possibilidades de melhoria, não é uma realidade que vamos ver em alguns resultados, que temos aviários de condições bem mais precárias, auxiliado com manejo, com uma série de, de coisas que têm resultados, às vezes, mais é, eficientes do que de galpões dessa maneira. Você deve sempre lembrar que criar chicken é biologia, não é maths. Um plus um não sempre dá dois. There are instances where you have very poor infrastructure and equipment, but with good management, you get much better results compared to um, high tech. Mas o que ocorre é que quanto mais controle temos dentro do aviário, é maior uniformidade dentro durante o ano dos resultados você tem. Mm. What we should always remember: the more control you have over the conditions, is the better performance and more uniform results you'll get. Aviários de pressão negativa, com alta tecnologia, com é, todo o sistema que compõe um sistema de, de aviários de pressão negativa. Né? É, forro, é, cortinas, exaustores, em quantidade suficiente para que dê a velocidade de vento da fase inicial, da fase intermediária e da fase final do frango. This is a demonstration of a high-tech negative pressure pen with... Um all the bells and the whistles. It has um, insulated ceiling, curtains, exhaust fans um, that could adjust the, the, the rate of airflow in accordance to the phase that the birds are in, brooding, growth, and finishing. Também aviários de pressão negativa, com distribuição de, de equipamento e controle do ambiente, desde a fase inicial do pinto. Mm. This is another picture of a negative pressure pen with all of the um, equipment and so on in place. Uh, everything is controlled from day one until the end of the crop. 
temos à direita um galpão já construído para, para as condições de ambiente negativo e à esquerda um aviário que foi adaptado para essas condições. Ok. On the left... Pode repetir? O da direita, um aviário já construído okay. para essas condições. Uh -huh. The picture on the right is a pen that was built as a negative, a negative pressure pen. Um, the other one is a conventional pen that was adapted to negative pressure. Aviário de pressão negativa que está sendo utilizado na região norte, é, ao invés de painéis evaporativos, com custo mais reduzido, utilizando uma tela chamada sombrite. Não entendi. No processo de pressão negativa, é, tem os painéis evaporativos, que são aqueles painéis que vai na frente do aviário, onde coloca a umidade e é por onde passa a ventilação de entrada no galpão. Me perdi. <risos> Vamos de novo. O, na frente do aviário, uh -huh. é, de pressão negativa, uh -huh. é, tem os painéis uh -huh. evaporativos, que são, uh, evapor uh, parece um radiador. Uh -huh. <risos> All right, at the, uh, in front of the negative pressure pen, there are some, uh, some panels for evaporation. É, no norte tem se utilizado bastante, com custos mais reduzidos, a utilização de uma tela chamada sombrite. Mm -hmm. All right, um, what some people use to, to reduce costs are a cement, a cement fiber panel. Um, I don't know if Anybody here is, remembers long ago, we used to get some roofing tiles that were made out of asbestos. It's a similar type of material, it's not asbestos, it's a cement fiber. Mm -hmm. São alternativas de utilização de aviários mais antigos para adaptar uma condição necessária de ambiência. It's all an example of how you could um, adapt older, more conventional pens to negative pressure. Então são instalados nebulizadores, é, bicos nebulizadores na frente aqui do galpão e essa tela vai é, colada na tela do, do aviário, essa sombrite vai colada na tela do aviário. Então ela retém um pouco da umidade, filtra um pouco aquela umidade para que o ar entre fresco e, e menos úmido. So what they do is install foggers in front of the cement fiber panels, which would absorb the moisture, so when the, the fans blow air into the pen, it's a little, it's cooler and fresher. Ok. Os aviários de pressão negativa, tipo Dark House, são os aviários de mais tecnologia, aviários que controlam a, a iluminação do, do frango e que tende a ter mais uniformidade, mais resultado positivo dentro deste trabalho. The Dark House neg negative pressure is a little uh, more advanced technology. Um, it controls the lighting that the birds are offered, and the end result is you get a more uniform lot. Os aviários de pressão é positiva é, são bastante utilizados e bastante eficientes também, mas depende de uma condição climática de umidade menor. Okay, um, positive pressure house, houses are, um, could give you good results as well but um, they're dependent on an environment where there's a lower degree of humidity. Onde são instalados ventiladores é, na, na longitudinal do aviário, as cortinas são fechadas e faz-se um túnel de ventilação dentro do, do aviário. E a temperatura é reduzida com a utilização da nebulização dentro do aviário. Ok. Um, fans are installed in series, along the length of the pen. Um, the sides are uh, blinded off, and so you create a tunnel that pulls the hot air out of the pen. Cooler is further enhanced by the use of foggers in the pen. Os aviários abertos são aviários que a cortina fica levantada, a ventilação natural corre, e ela é auxiliada também com ventiladores e nebulizadores para que consiga ter uma temperatura adequada dentro do aviário. Open-sided houses, um, as the name implies, the curtains are left open, so the natural air passes through the pen. The, you could also use fans and foggers to assist in um, creating the appropriate environment. E pode ser aviários com forro, como da esquerda, ou aviários sem o forro, como da direita. 
right? They could either have a drop ceiling like the picture on the left or um, some of them are without any ceiling at all. Bom, é, aqui está uma tabela da região norte, é, onde apresentamos alguns resultados médios entre os diferentes tipos de aviários que são utilizados lá. Aviários é, aberto, sem o forro, aviários de pressão positiva com forro, negativa e dark house. Podemos observar, em termos de mortalidade, que todos os três tipos tiveram mortalidades semelhantes. Um, this table is some growth results for the northern region of the country on the different housing types. A idade um, das aves também abatida é uma empresa com abatedor e leva as aves com a idade média entre 40 e 42 dias para o abate. The different housing types are on the right. It was important to note that the mortality on the all the housing types were quite similar. Mas podemos observar uma diferença significativa no ganho de peso diário da, dessas aves, porque as condições ambientais para que o frango ingira a ração durante todo o período do dia são mais satisfatórias. What is, um, what is noticeable is the daily weight gain, the difference in daily weight gain as the technology improves. Fazendo com que tenhamos um resultado de fator de produção do índice, index com melhor melhor tamanho, né, com maior intensidade. And the result is that your performance index under the um, higher technology type housing is much better than with the open house. Não podemos observar que no galpão aberto, a, o fator médio índice de performance foi de 390, o de galpão com pressão positiva 417, negativa de 430 e os dark house chegaram a 480 mm -hmm. de fator de médio. So you, you get a range that for open house you have a performance index of 390 or thereabout, all the way down to dark house, which is 487. Bom, uh, aqui é da região do Nordeste, alguns resultados eh, sem fechamento, só ficha de, de dentro do galpão, mostrando o aviário também, só para demonstrar alguma curiosidade de resultados. Este é um galpão de pressão negativo. This is um, the daily record sheet for a pen in the northeast, a negative pressure pen in the northeast. Um aviário com 37.600 aves. É... Right. 37, it, it, it started with 37.600, tem 14 aves por metro quadrado. 33.600 aves com 14 aves por metro quadrado. 37.600 birds at a stock rate of hunt. O quantos aves por 14 aves por metro quadrado. 14 birds per meter squared. Essa densidade porque o frango na, na região é conduzido até um peso médio de 3 kg. Então, uh, com 14 aves por metro quadrado, nós já temos 42 kg por metro quadrado de carne, né? Right. These birds are raised to about three kilos. So at 14 birds per meter squared, you end up with quantos kilos per meter quadrado? Quantos 42. Kilo? At about 42 kilograms per, per meter squared. Yeah. <laughs> é, então, veja a mortalidade dentro deste, deste aviário, né, com... 35, 6, 7, 8. Com 38 dias a ficha estava apontando, tínhamos abaixo de 2% de mortalidade. Né? Com 35, estava 1,5%. Com 38 dias, a mortalidade foi abaixo de 2%. E embaixo ali também não está muito, muito visível na ficha, mas para se ver a, o peso semanal da, dessa ave. Com 6 dias... Ele estava 15% acima. Um... At the bottom of the table the, is the weekly weights. At the end of the first week, it was 15% above the, 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 breeders, um, the breeders average. The second week, the second is about... Yeah, it's an average of 10% above the, the breed average. É só para mostrar a importância de que 
a, a qualidade ambiental faz com que você tenha, mantenha uma regularidade de mortalidade né, é, e um ganho de peso constante. Uhum. Uh, Eu you this slide to emphasize that con proper control of the environmental conditions, the effect it has on mortality and your daily weight gain. Outro aviário de pressão é, negativa, é do mesmo produtor, também 33.600 aves. This, this is another pen on the same farm, same amount of birds, 37.600. Só exemplificando também que mortalidade mantém-se dentro de um padrão normal e o peso continua avançando. Este é um aviário aberto, é onde tem sistema de nebulização e o sistema de ventilador, é, mas é uma região é, mais úmida, que é a região do litoral. This is an open-sided pen with fans and foggers um, in, uh, in a region that is a bit more humid along the coast. Então podemos observar que a mortalidade, a mortalidade depois dos 35 dias é iniciou um aumento desse volume de mortalidade dessa ave. We could see that from about 35 days, the mortality started to go up. Então, demonstra que a condição ambiental é, reflete bastante. Nessas, nessas regiões, a criação na fase inicial é mais facilitada, né? Mas chega na fase final, somente o ventilador e o nebulizador não dão as condições necessárias para que este frango se mantenha é, em conforto térmico e acaba aumentando a mortalidade e às vezes temos perdas bastante significativas em um dia. This just goes to show the importance of um, environmental conditions. Under these conditions, for the first few weeks of the, of the cycle, there's not any significant problem, but the birds get old and heavier, <coughs> it starts to take a greater toll on them, and coming on to the end of the cycle, you could suffer heavy losses uh, on a day-to-day -day basis because of um, heat stress. Mesma coisa, só regiões diferentes, com tipos de criações diferentes, e galpões também abertos e com, com distribuição de ventiladores, é, e aí a gente fica na dependência da época do ano, se é uma época mais fresca ou uma época mais quente, para que se tenha resultados melhores ou piores. Né? This is a similar photograph to the one before, just emphasizing that under these types of conditions, your production varies depending on the season of the year, the time of the year, um, and the environmental conditions. Under these conditions, just fans and foggers alone are usually not enough to... Um, To, to give the, the birds a comfortable environment. Mesma coisa. Uh, same thing. Aviários uh, aberto, também com ventiladores, nebulizadores, cortina, para que se tente uh, amenizar a condição climática na, na época do ano. Yeah. Open house pen, fans, foggers, all in attempt to, to stem the effects of, of, of the climatic conditions. É, também mostrando a estrutura de, de aviários, aviários antigos, aviários de pé direito, às vezes baixo, é, que vai se colocando alternativas de forro, de ventiladores, para se tentar amenizar essa temperatura e tirar resultados satisfatórios. Veja que a mortalidade do, deste lote aí está pequena, o ganho de peso dele está bom. This is another example of a older model pen. Um, curtains, very low roof, in which attempts are made to to improve it by putting in fans and to, to cool Esta grande é uma grande de 13 de 13 mil aves. Mm -hmm. Há dois anos atrás, eu acompanhei uma mortalidade de um sábado para domingo dela ter morrido 3.500 aves em um dia. Mm -hmm. He said on this particular farm about two years ago, in this particular pen, which had 13,000 birds, from Saturday to Sunday, they lost 3,000 and something because of... Um, The, the weather. Então, como comentamos, o frango responde pelo aquilo que nós proporcionamos a ele. Se economizamos na, na instalação de equipamentos, nas instalações, é, o retorno dele é variável de acordo com as condições climáticas que ele recebe. 
So just to reinforce, you might try to save some money by building um, cheap infrastructure, using cheap equipment and so on, but your results will reflect that by not being consistent. A viagem sem nenhuma estrutura, é, ficamos à mercê das condições ambientais. Né? Se o dia passa o período do, da criação em condições de climáticas razoáveis, você tira um resultado razoável. Se as condições climáticas são adversas, chega no final com uma mortalidade desse tamanho aqui. And then we left at the mercy of the climate. If we have good weather throughout the crop, we get good results. If we have bad weather or exceptionally hot days, we end up suffering losses. Só um adendo, é, temperaturas acima de 20 graus, hoje 68 graus Fahrenheit, para cada um grau de temperatura que aumenta no, no ambiente, você incrementa o consumo de água e diminui o consumo de ração. Então, a, as condições ambientais dentro do galpão, se não estiver dentro da área de conforto térmico da ave, é, para cada grau de temperatura que está acima, você já pode ter em mente que o seu resultado tende a piorar. Sim, então, o que esse slide está mostrando é that as the temperature goes up, the birds increase their water consumption and the feed consumption decreases. So if you don't provide the conditions for the bird to be within its comfort zone, it ends up not eating and losing weight. Não é o mesmo a tabela da anterior, só demonstrando que em galpões de pressão positiva uh, nós tiramos bons resultados também. Veja que foi um fator de 480 de, de dentro de um galpão ali que foi resultado semelhantes ou, ou até superiores aos galpões é, de pressão negativa. He, this is the same slide that you saw before, but he just wanted to point out to you that it's not all about technology because you could see in a positive pressure pen you got some results very similar to the ones you got in a negative pressure pen. Porque tudo isso depende de muitas alternativas que são lançadas para diminuir o impacto dessa temperatura externa no aviário, né? Yeah. What, um, what matters is uh, how you use the opportunities you have to reduce the, the temperature and control the environment in, in the poultry house. Desde o momento que escolhe a área para construir o galpão, de tentar colocar o galpão na posição mais leste-oeste possível, sabendo que durante o ano o sol oscila numa angulação aí de 20 graus, então se a temperatura é, escolher o grau, o ângulo de, de, de variação, que seja no período de mais quente naquela região. É, e começa do momento que você escolhe a locação que você vai construir o pen, como você orienta o pen, este ou oeste, considerando o ângulo do sol e o movimento do sol um, throughout o ano. Escolha do tipo de, não sei como chama aqui, antes teve dificuldade de chamar ali, a comunheira, o topo do galpão. Uhum. Né? É, se o galpão for ter forro, não há necessidade de preocupação com isso, mas em galpões sem forro há necessidade de verificar qual tipo de abertura que vai se fazer em cima, que isso auxilia a retirada do ar quente de dentro do aviário. A escolha do topo do roof, como você escolhe construir o topo do roof, If you're putting in a drop ceiling, it doesn't matter that much, but if you're not using a drop ceiling, it could be important because it helps with the removal of hot air from the pen. A escolha do tipo de telha é importantíssimo. É, regiões mais quentes no, no Nordeste, a gente trabalha com telhas de barro. É, aqui tem uma tendência mais de utilizar a telha de alumínio. Né? Então, os tipos de telhas são diferenciais importantes, porque hoje tem-se telhas chamadas telhas isotérmicas, que tem uma camada de proteção isolante, que facilita com que você tenha uma melhor ambiência no aviário com menor custo. O material que você cobre o roof é também importante. Um, uma wide, wide variety de material é usado. Alguns lugares têm uma preferência para alumínio, outros lugares têm clay tiles. Um, they're New, new type of materials on the market now that are um, insu insulated, so they would assist in, in keeping the pen cool as well. Okay. Também alternativas para quem já tem o aviário construído, a pintura do aviário. Né? Mm -hmm. é, a pintura do telhado auxilia na reflexão da luz e a diminuição da temperatura interna do aviário. Um, an alternative for someone who has already built pens is to paint the roof. Um, painting the roof helps to reflect the rays of the sun and um, keeps the inside of the pen cooler. Por muitos anos utilizávamos misturas de cal com cola é, para fazer a pintura dos aviários. 
mas, além de trabalhosa, ela tem um, uma durabilidade muito curta. Às vezes, sei, a cada seis meses, tem que repintar, a mão de obra é muito grande. Hoje tem tintas especiais que você pinta e tem uma durabilidade maior. Um, traditionally, what was used was a mixture of glue and whitewash, but um, it's a lot of work to apply and it doesn't last very long. So they now have new products on the market that um, last longer and are much easier to... Um trabalho apply. demonstrando a diferença entre um galpão com telha pintada e não pintada, né? é, onde ao meio-dia, aí às 12 horas, nós tivemos temperatura do galpão de telha não pintada de 47,1 graus Celsius, conta 35.7 na mesma instalação no galpão pintado. This table is um, a research someone did on the effects of painting the roof. If you look at the first two lines, the top one is uh, on painted roof, where you got a temperature of 33.7 degrees Celsius, as compared to a painted roof where the temperature in the pen was 27.6 degrees. Em outras alternativas que temos, viáveis e que todos podem praticar, dependendo das instalações, é o plantio de árvores, a arborização próximos ao aviário. Outra método de reduzir o heat in the pen é por plantar trees to the offer shade. É algo que todos everyone could do quite easily. O cuidado que temos que tomar é a utilização de, de árvores que tenha o um tronco mais ereto e que tem uma copa interessante, maior, para poder dar um sombreamento. Plantas que têm tronco retorcidos e, e a copa muito baixa, dificulta a circulação de ar e isso atrapalha na ventilação bastante. A um, precaução que tem que tomar é escolher uma espécie de árvore que cresce tall e straight, com uma árvore muito larga, então você pode conseguir uma boa cheia. Um, árvores que branchem rápido e têm uma árvore low crown, interferem com a ventilação. Densidade, devemos trabalhar com densidades menores em regiões que esteja muito quente, no período que esteja muito quente, trabalhar com densidades menores, auxilia na qualidade da cama, auxilia na qualidade do, da carcaça que vai para o do frango, que vai para o abatedouro e diminui as mortalidades também. Um, stocking rate is another management tool we could use. Um, in hot regions or during the hottest part of the year, you could reduce your stocking rate. Um, The birds would grow better, you'd have a larger bird to, to, to send to the plant, and your mortality would be reduced. A utilização de ventiladores, que é muito importante dentro da, dessas instalações. Mm -hmm. Fans, we, 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 we looked at that before. Ventiladores, nebulizadores, as cortinas, que são bastante importantes. Yeah. Fans, misters, the use of um, the management of your curtains. Chamado, os chamados quebra-ventos, para fazer com que o, o vento circule com maior velocidade yeah. sobre as aves. Um, installation of baffles in the pen, which um, force the air to circulate um, at a faster rate. Instalações de cortinas eficientes, que você faz, possa controlar se for um galpão de pressão positiva ou negativa. Há uma necessidade de uma vedação perfeita para que não ocorra fuga de, de ar. Mm -hmm. Properly installed curtains, very important, regardless if it's a negative pressure or a positive pressure pen, it's important that the curtains seal the pen completely so you don't have air escaping. E nos aviários de pressão negativa, a necessidade que de, dos exaustores e das placas evaporativas para manter a ambiência dentro do aviário. And for the... <coughs> Nos aviários de pressão negativa, a necessidade da instalação dos... dos For autores. the negative pressure pens, excuse. You, they need to have the exhaust fans and the evaporative plates. Um, correct number, correct size, functioning correctly. Bom, a tabela é muito pequenininha, é só para demonstrar que é, é uma unidade com galpões abertos, com galpões é, de pressão positiva e, e que mantém um nível de resultados razoável. Right. Essa, essa fechou o mês de agosto com 390 de índice de fator. Uh -huh. Apologize that the writing is so small, but it's just a table of um, producer's results to show that even with positive pressure pens you could get um, um satisfactory results. Cortei um pedacinho dela para ficar maior um pouquinho, mas veja que tem resultados é, bastante expressivos de fator de 436, 434 em galpões de pressão positiva ou de galpões de ambiente aberto. Mas yeah. sempre com ventiladores nessa região, todas com ventilador, nebulizador e a maioria com fogos. 
Okay. So you could see the last column, which is the performance index. You all or most of them over 400. And these are all positive pressure pens, but they have fans, foggers, and most of them have drop ceilings. Então, para qualquer tipo de instalações, nós devemos estar sempre em mente que precisamos de dar as condições necessárias para que o pinto desenvolva bem. Temperatura, umidade, ventilação, alimento e água satisfatória. So, regardless of uh, the type of infrastructure you have, some things are basic to your management to ensure that you have a good result. And the list on the slide there. A AVE nos últimos anos evoluiu muito geneticamente, nutricionalmente, sanitariamente, mas ainda temos muito, muita resistência do produtor com relação às instalações. Produtores que têm instalações de 10 anos, 20 anos, 30 anos e quer fazer uma adaptação ainda nessas instalações. Então, mesmo que a genética e a nutrição tenham evoluído a um ponto tão rápido, o produtor is the one most resistant to change, especially in terms of adapting his infrastructure to, to, to meet the changes that have occurred in the other areas. Se for fazer, que faça bem feito. Tem produtor que coloca dois ventiladores no início do galpão e acha que tá, colocou ventiladores dentro do aviário. Então coloque números suficientes para atender a demanda. And those who choose to change, they should do it properly. Um, some people, you talk to them, they say, yes, we'll change, and then they go and put two fans in a 400-foot pen and, and think that that would solve the problem. Instale nebulizadores em número suficiente. Instale é, cortinas, forro dentro desses galpões de número suficiente. É, pulverizadores em cima do galpão, se for necessário. E reduz a densidade para que a gente tenha finalizado yeah. um resultado bom. So you should install the correct number of fans in the correct way. The Sufficient foggers, if necessary, put sprinklers on the roof. Do, do whatever is necessary to make sure that the, the birds have the type of environment they need. Existe no mercado alguns aditivos que se coloca é, ou na ração ou na água que ajuda o estresse térmico. Mas na verdade, quando você não são produtos que você fica utilizando constantemente. Quando você detecta um, pró, um, um fato de estresse térmico que você vai utilizar, você já teve perda de ave. Mas o uso de bicarbonato de sódio, de cloreto de potássio, de ácido acetil salicílico, dos ácidos orgânicos, auxilia é, nessa controle de estresse térmico da ave. E há produtos que você pode colocar no ácido ou no ácido que ajudam a controlar o estresse. Muitas vezes eles são misusados, as pessoas pensam que você... You use them all the time, and that will help to reduce the stress, but no, they should be used if you detect a problem. Um, they're used to control, control that problem in, in that, at that period of time. E bons resultados temos conseguido com o incremento do manejo noturno. Uh, colocar funcionários, colocar a, a atividade noturna bastante intensa para que este frango coma e beba nos horários mais frescos do dia, e durante o dia o galpão fica mais tranquilo, somente com o sistema de ventilador e nebulizador funcionando, sem funcionário ou sem estímulo para este consumo. Night management is another tool we have, where um, we could do most of our management activities during the cooler part, in the night. You have all your workmen in there stimulating the birds, getting them to eat during the night, so that during the day, they could be left resting with just the ventilation system working and, and cooling the pen. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ivanio. We have two more, two more presentations for this session, but what we'll do is only have one. So uh, Dr. Gary Butcher will do his presentation now, and then we'll save uh, um, Mike Jones's for after lunch, the first thing after lunch. We have at least one of these set, one of these presentations after lunch will not be done, so it, it doesn't really humbug the timing. So you you know that you don't have to be worried about. Actually, two of them are not, but um, but then Dr. Ali has to speak, so we'll give him some extra time. <laughs> um, so just just um, a few takeaways from from Dr. Ivanio's brilliant presentation. Uh, we must all move because of, of uh, global warming towards negative pressure. Um, some of our countries like Ghana, we pay 35 cents US a kilowatt hour. So it's a bit tough for us to move in that direction at this moment. That will change. 
Um, but what he did say is even if you invest in technology without improving management, you will not gain the benefits that you are actually expecting. So spending the money is not necessarily the solution to the problem. It probably makes it worse if you don't improve management. Two, it is very important from what you're seeing here that in order for him to make the presentation, he had to have very good record keeping. One of the biggest problems in the Caribbean is we don't think that record keeping is important. Record keeping is absolutely important in order to be able to identify what your feed conversion is, your mortality, your performance index, because we must rate ourselves against the best in the world if we want to improve. And what he says, if you know your performance index is now, because we at, for sure at Bounty know ours, and with natural ventilation and positive pressure, as you saw in the last slide, that you could get 400, and 400 is an unbelievable number anywhere in the world. So thanks, Dr. Ivanio. Yeah. <laughs> Next up is Dr. Gary Butcher. Dr. Butcher, most of you have met him yesterday. He's a veterinarian from the US. Doc is a poultry specialist and professor at the University of Florida. Uh, we met Dr. Butcher in the early 90s in Guyana. Dr. Butcher is unbelievable at his, at his job in terms of identifying poultry diseases. So he, he is perfectly positioned to share his knowledge. As I said, I think we said yesterday, over 60 countries, he travels all over the world. And um, he will be presenting on protecting avian health from in in infectious diseases. And this is also sponsored by Champrix. Dr. Butcho. Okay, the title of my presentation this morning is Protecting Poultry from Infectious Diseases. And again, I'd like to express my appreciation to Brett De Jong with Champrix for supporting me uh, to travel to this program. Okay, I think you, from our earlier presentation today, I think we all learned how much the broiler has changed and how much genetic potential the broiler has. If we look at the broiler in 1957 at 42 days of age, the bird would be about 1.2 pounds. Well, that same bird today at 42 days would be 6.6 .6 pounds. As well, the, the feed, Feed conversion ratio has, has improved dramatically. So what we have today is a bird with incredible genetic potential. And as you learned earlier, we also have a bird that's much more fragile, a bird that's much more susceptible to the effects, as we heard earlier, of heat stress or, or poor air quality. But also we have a bird today that is more susceptible to the effects of infectious diseases. If you look at the bird on the left, that bird had a lot of natural resistance to diseases. The bird on the right, obviously, is much more susceptible to diseases. For example, if you look at mycoplasma, you know, in 1957, in the effect on broilers was minimal. Today, that same disease can be devastating in our modern birds. This slide here is, is you're probably wondering why I'm showing a slide of a, of a chicken in a restaurant, but basically, in some countries you go to, in this case in Vietnam, they sell commercial broilers, but they also sell in restaurants the native birds. I guess they call them yellow chickens, and here they call them, I think, what, Creole chickens? Something like that. So, you know, these Creole chickens are much more resistant to disease and heat stress. You know, if you look at these birds right here, you know, these birds would not have problems with ascites or heart attack or, or wooden breast. They, they look more like a leghorn than, than actually a broiler. But actually, these birds right here actually are more expensive in a restaurant because because they're considered a, a delicacy. Uh, to me, it was very interesting where they, when you go to these restaurants where they serve this type of chicken, they leave the heads on the birds so you can be sure they're not trying to sneak in a commercial broilers because people actually prefer these. Okay, as I, as I give my presentation today and at the end of the presentation, if we have time to discuss, um, there's a couple points I want you to think about related to biosecurity. 
I want you to think about the, the, the concept of disease tolerance. And by disease tolerance, I mean in some countries, people have a high tolerance to disease. If you go to some countries, um, they have a lot of diseases, lots of vaccines. If a new disease comes in, they just simply think about what additional vaccine they can add to help control the problem. Well, other countries have a very low tolerance to disease. If they get any disease into their flocks, they react very quickly and very aggressively. Another point is why do some countries have more diseases than others? And thirdly, what factors do countries with high disease levels have in common? And, and really, from when, you, when you step back and take a look at disease levels in the poultry industry in different countries, you're gonna find out that countries with high disease levels have many characteristics in common. And, and countries with lower disease levels have certain characteristics in common. And these characteristics are mainly in the structure of the industry and the way the birds are managed. So we can discuss this at the end of the presentation. Well, as far as objectives go in relate, relating to disease, I think we all have to agree that disease prevention through effective biosecurity practices is the most important thing. We're not in an industry where we can allow the animals to get sick and recover. We have to prevent the disease. Our, our animals don't live long enough to get a disease and recover. So disease prevention is everything. If on occasion there's a breakdown in the biosecurity and the disease is able to enter onto the farm, then we have to rely and ensure that the chickens are immunocompetent. So we have to rely on reducing stress and also on proper vaccination. But remember, vaccination is the second line of defense. Biosecurity is the first. Well, what is biosecurity? In bio, I mean, we've all heard the term biosecurity, we use it all the time, but what does this fancy word really mean? Biosecurity. To me, I have a very simple definition. I think it means informed common sense. Informed common sense, very simple. Basically, you learn a couple principles of how disease is spread, and then the rest of it depends upon your common sense, okay? Now, when we, when we talk about infectious diseases, you know, we have to look at ourselves as humans and look at these infectious diseases that we're fighting to try to control and prevent. I think as humans, we have some advantages over diseases. I mean, if you, look, if you think about it, diseases don't have legs. They don't have wings, they can't fly, they can't see. They don't have brains. Actually, infectious diseases really depend upon us to spread them from farm to farm. So think about that. Diseases, they can't think, they can't fly, they can't walk. They depend upon us making mistakes and allowing them to spread. So what can we do to try to prevent this from happening? Well, I like this slide right here because what it's saying here is when diseases spread from one farm to another, one farm to another, I can say with great confidence that over 90% of the time, if a disease spreads from one farm to another, that's say more than one kilometer apart, it's because of people, that's us, equipment, and vehicles. 90% of the time, a disease is spread by people, equipment, and vehicles. Focus on those three important points and we can control most of our disease problems. I was asked one time by, a, by, a, by an owner of a poultry company, he said that he wants to, he had his breeder house and, and, the, and the growing house, the pullet house right next to the breeder farm. He wanted to build the pullet house away from the breeder farm to try to prevent diseases from spreading back and forth. He asked me how far away should I, should I build this house with, with the, for, the, for the, growing, the growing the breeders. I said, well, you know, two kilometers or maybe one mile or something. And he thought that he thought that was crazy. He said, what about airborne transmission? And I said, well, I really don't think airborne transmission over one kilometer is gonna happen. Well, he ended up building this, this new farm about 200 kilometers away, a very large distance. 
And the first flock of new birds that he brought into that, that farm broke with all the diseases that they had at the breeder farm. In other words, diseases very rarely spread through the air from farm to farm. They're going to spread there by us, by our vehicles, and by our equipment that we spread, that we take from farm to farm without taking the proper precautions. So remember how diseases spread at least 90% of the time. Another important factor you need to, need to know or think about when we're talking about disease is how long can these diseases live in the environment away from the chicken? Let's say we talk about a disease like, let's look at a disease like, say, um, mycoplasma or, or, or cari infectious coryza. You know, these, these, these diseases can infect the chicken, they infect the chicken for life. But if you have that disease on your farm and you depopulate that farm completely, even if you don't disinfect, within three or four days, all of that organism is dead, even without disinfecting, okay? Very fragile organisms, if you have all in, all out. We look at other diseases like gumboro disease or coccidiosis, these can live for, for many months, many, many months in the environment, even if chickens are not present. So if you have problems with these diseases, you have to deal with these differently. You have to depopulate the farm and do, and do a very, very comprehensive program of cleaning and disinfection to at least reduce the level of these organisms. So it's very important if you have a problem to get a diagnosis. I know a lot, a lot of farms, they say, well, the birds are 32 days of age. They just started getting sick. They're going to the plant in two days. Well, we don't care what the disease was. No, you still have to know what the disease is so you can go in there and know how to decontaminate the farms and to know what type of precautions that you need. This is a, a photo micrograph, electron micrograph of the infectious bronchitis virus. And this is one of, the, one of these viruses that we fight against. And again, they have no legs, no wings, no eyes, no, no brain. They we depend upon us to spread. If we take common sense precautions, we can prevent that. This is the um, o, o assist of coccidia. Again, we know coccidia are worldwide in, in, in occurrence. I think it's safe to say every commercial broiler farm in the world has been exposed to coccidiosis. It's because we've tracked it around. You know, this is a, it's very interesting. A couple years ago, I was asked to go to the island of, of the, the, the Galapagos where they have a very small poultry industry. You know, in this poultry industry, they only buy fertile eggs or day old chicks and they bring them in. They're not allowed to use vaccines and it's very isolated. You know, that's one of the most isolated places in the world. Well, in those chickens on the Galapagos, we found that they did have coccidiosis and they did have gumboro. So even in the most isolated industries in the world, those viruses, those um, parasites got there because of human error. A lot of times when you visit poultry farms, you see a lot of signs out front about stopping, disinfecting, and on and on and on. And these signs are valuable, but it's important as far as biosecurity goes that this will apply to everybody. There's nobody above the rules when it comes to biosecurity, even the owner of the company. And I'll, I'll give you another example that I think is really interesting is that um, there, there's a company, um, I guess I really shouldn't say what country it was, but there was a company in Central America. Um, they don't have laryngotracheitis there. And this company, I got a call one day from their veterinarian saying they have a one flock of breeders that, that are coughing out blood. It looks like coccidiosis. But they didn't have that disease in that region. So they sent up tissues, we confirmed it was coccidiosis, they depopulated that breeder flock at a great cost. And of course the owner was very angry. You know, how did this disease get into one of my breeder flocks? So he told the veterinarians to investigate every person that had visited that breeder flock in the last five days. I mean, every person was scrutinized, was questioned and everything. And then when I talked to the veterinarian, because I'd worked with this disease a lot, I said, no, the, the incubation period from exposure to clinical disease is about 10 to 12 days in most cases. Go back 10 to 12 days. 
and 10 to, day, 10 to 12 days prior, the owner of the company had, had a visitor come in from Chile where they have this disease. They went straight from the airport to this particular breeder farm 10 to 12 days before without taking any precautions because he was the owner, right? And boom, they figured out where the disease came from. After that, nobody was allowed to talk about this disease anymore at that company because the owner was not very pleased with him, with any, with himself too, because that was a great cost. But the point is, you know, you have to know what the disease is, know what the incubation period is. And remember, nobody, including the owner, can be above the rules. Well, what is this thing? If you go to, the, to, to Romania and visit poultry houses there, they have these inside every house. And what they tell you is, it's to help keep diseases out. They, they have these in every house you walk into. You know, and when you try to tell them, you know, that, that doesn't work, they remind you that we don't have diseases on this farm, so just mind my own business. So, so you, what you learn is if, if it doesn't cost a lot, doesn't hurt anything, let it be, right? You know, it's, it's, in their mind, it's helping. Okay, in some places you go to, in some countries, there's a lot of security around broiler farms. And sometimes there's armed security. This man has the job of keeping off people off the farm that shouldn't be there. Whether they're there, you know, for whatever reason, they got to talk to him before they can enter the farm. And he has the means to, to keep you out if needed. He basically, around most poultry farms, we like to say, at least minimally, have a fence that says no, no entry without authorization. This keeps people that just happen to be going by that want to look at the chickens or something to get out and possibly bring in diseases. So park your vehicle outside the farm unless it has to be on the farm. And again, this is what I consider to be, to be minimal biosecurity for the farms that you need to visit, have at least clean coveralls for each farm and have rubber boots. This, this is the minimum for biosecurity. And this person here, obviously, to get into the farm, he has to have a key, he has to have authorization to enter. Foot baths, I think, are, are very important. And this is something that, you know, it has definitely shown itself to be very, very helpful in preventing the spread of diseases. Because a lot of our, I mean, we go home every day, we, we, we change our clothes, shower, but often, I don't know about you, but my shoes don't get cleaned, get cleaned every day. You know, very, very rarely do they get cleaned. But this is a foot bath, and this is what I consider to be a properly constructed foot bath. In this foot bath here, you see three different tanks. You see one here, one here, and one here. And the first one here, you have soapy water de detergent. The second one, you have disinfectant. What's in the third one? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll answer that question in a minute. So the, you step into the first one here where it has detergent to clean, right? And then you step into the second one and it has a disinfectant. What's the purpose of a disinfectant? To, this is not hard, to disinfect, right? And I'm, I'm saying that because I want you to remember that. A disinfectant is not to clean. A disinfectant is to disinfect. If you step into the disinfectant with feces or litter on your, sh in your footwear, step into the disinfectant, the disinfectant doesn't penetrate some feces on your shoes. It also contaminates the disinfectant and it activates it. So first of all, clean completely. Any surface you're going to disinfect has to be cleaned first. Be completely cleaned, then you disinfect. So you Clean, you disinfect, and then what do you do next? You rinse it off. Okay, that's the wrong answer, but that's the answer that I wanted, okay? You, you disinfect, and then you step over and go onto the farm. So what's the purpose of this? When you leave, it's soapy water again, okay? Now, that's very, the, the, you fell right into the trap, okay? Because the, the trap is, when you step into a disinfectant, it doesn't kill on contact, it takes time. 
You know, ideally, we'd want you to stand in that disinfectant bath for 20 minutes. We know that's not going to happen. So you step out of the disinfectant, you let the disinfectant dry onto your boots, and then you go about your business. It, you know, there, there's a rule of thumb that disinfectants take about 20 minutes to kill properly. So if you wash the disinfectant off, you've wasted your money and you wasted your time. So proper foot baths. Here he is right here. You can see the depth of the foot bath. He's got brushes. You know, so this is a properly run disinfectant foot bath. Now, how often should you change the solutions? I guess you change them when they need it. Okay? See, there's, there's nothing I'm going to say here today that's rocket science, right? You change it when it needs it. If it's dirty, you change it. If it's not dirty, it's good for several days. Now, here's some... I could actually have a collection of foot baths of the world. I know that's strange. But I'm going to show you a couple of these. And th this is a foot bath that's not constructed properly. Actually, it's not deep enough. It's contaminated. What do you think about this foot bath? This is a Bulgarian version of a foot bath. I, had to, I took a picture of it. You walk in, you step on this, and you say, what are we doing? And he says, well, we sprayed the, 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 the litter with disinfectant, and now you're stepping on the, on, on the litter with the disinfectant. What happens when you have organic material around disinfectants? They're inactivated. So th this, is, this is worse than nothing. Now, now, the students think that's funny. <laughs> but we all know that we have experience with worse than nothing. Okay. If you look at this foot bath, though, it, it used to be right here, right here, right here. It used to go across here. And they used to have disinfectant in it. But why do you, why do you think they changed to, took the disinfectant out and, and put sawdust? I, I kind of gave you a clue at first. This is Bulgaria. It, it, it's frozen about nine months out of the year. So they had an ice there about nine months out of the year. So instead of having ice, they decided just to break it out, put sawdust in there, and this is worse than nothing. Okay, here's another, another foot bath that I think is very pretty. But at the same time, it's not very deep. It's contaminated. When I asked them, how do you drain this? They said, we, we get our hand and we swish it out. <laughs> Somebody thinks I'm funny. <laughs> OK. okay. So, and once again, what, what else do you see in this foot bath that that's wrong? It's, it's, it's so obvious that sometimes you can't see it. When you look at this foot bath, it's halfway in the shade, halfway in the sun. What happens to disinfectants in the sun? They're inactivated. What happens in disinfectants if you have the tank outside where it rains every day? Yeah, so it's pretty. They got flowers and everything, but it, it's, it, it's not a good disinfectant. Okay, here's a, I should, maybe shouldn't say it, here's a Venezuelan foot bath. I don't understand it either, but we were forced to step in it before we walked into the house. So, it's true. <laughs> okay, this is an American foot bath. And um, this is embarrassing, but, th but this is what we, you know, you walk to a house, you tell them to get a foot bath, you go there, they have it, and then you tell them it's not good and they get mad. But this is not a good foot bath, right? You got every kind of creature in there. Not, not good, very obvious to us. Okay, be careful what you stick your feet in, okay? We have to separate these people. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Be careful what you stick your, stick your feet in. Now, here was a very interesting foot bath. This was the entry to the poultry house. This was the foot bath. I was very proud of myself. I walked up, put my feet in the foot bath, walked into the house. Every, everybody behind me walked up there, did the same thing, walked into the house, and we, we thought we were doing right. It wasn't a very good foot bath, but we found out it wasn't a foot bath. <laughs> um, he's trying to explain to his dog about these crazy Americans and, and what they just did to his drinker. So this is, you know, so, you know, it's embarrassing and, you know, I, I feel very bad for the dog. <laughs> but once again, I mean, it's a foot bath, right? True story. You can't make this up. Here's another example here. This is a Russian version of, of disposable boots. 
I, I had one on each foot when I walked into the house, and this is what I came out with after. Not very effective, is it? So sometimes, you know, doing, doing something like this or having a bad foot bath is worse, actually worse, than doing nothing. So we have to have it properly constructed and maintained. Okay, when, you, when vehicles have to enter a farm, especially a larger farm, it's good to have some security and also a way to disinfect the vehicles that have to enter the farm. If a vehicle doesn't have to be on the farm, don't, don't, don't go on the farm with it. Park it outside the farm. I know in the U.S. We're, we're so lazy, we drive up in our trucks right to the gate, right to the door of the chicken house so we can slide out of the seat into the house because we're so lazy. But it's really best to keep the vehicles off the farm unless they have to be there. And then we want to also properly disinfect the vehicles that have to go onto the farm to prevent disease. Here you can see the, the gentleman here, an armed security man who's going to take the information in the vehicles that have to enter. And here the vehicle goes through where it's disinfected on all sides. So this looks pretty good for the vehicle, but what are we forgetting? The inside of the vehicle, right? You know, we're not, we're, not, we're not doing anything to the inside of the vehicle. We're just washing the outside. But this is better than nothing, and it helps wash the outside of the vehicle. Here the vehicle comes through. This vehicle can now enter the premise. Same with showers. You know, we've all been to poultry farms before where they tell us we have to go take showers. And you go into that shower, and the water's ice cold. The shower's filthy. There's no soap. So what, what, what do you do when you walk into a shower at a farm and the water's real cold? You fake it, right? You fake it. You stick your hair into the water, get it wet, and come out with your towel and say, oh, that was good, you know? But, you know, we're not going to use a dirty shower. We want a properly constructed shower. If it's not, if it's not perfect, if it's not clean, doesn't have shampoo and soap, I'm not going to pick a bar of soap off the ground that has hairs all over it and use it. And I, I know that sounds gross to you kids, but you'll see it. You know, we're not going to use it, right? So provide a clean shower, warm water, clean towels, a place where you want, actually want to do. Where you want to take a shower, you want to be there. So here's our friend here. He's getting ready to take a shower. Here he's in the shower. And again, this is to emphasize, we want warm water. We want the shower to be clean. And we want to make sure that nothing goes into that farm that doesn't have to be. I know it's impossible for some people to, to part with their cell phones even for a few minutes on the farm. And I guess I've seen companies where they make them put the phones inside Ziploc bags if they absolutely can't do without it for five minutes. But we don't want to be taking anything onto that farm that could be contaminated. Here we are, all cleaned up, you know, clean clothes, showered, everything to go onto farms. And again, this would be more at the breeder level. You know, we're, 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 more, we're more valuable birds, long-lived birds. And this particular company here, this is a farm over here, and there's another house right here. This company, in their broilers, does not use vaccines. They don't have any diseases. They have incredible biosecurity. What is this thing here? Well, this is a broiler house, this is a broiler house, what is this? Pardon me? Right, this is security? The what? House for the dog. Oh, the dog. I wish. This is where he keeps his fighting chickens. So he takes them out to fight. Then he brings them back onto the farm where he has his, you know, supposedly disease free baby chicks. But in other words, we don't want to have any, any dogs or cats or, or, or birds of any kind on a, on a commercial poultry farm. You know, you, you birds cycle in and out, you clean up and disinfect. But this guy right here is going out on weekends to, to, to the, for the fighting, and then he comes back and spreads diseases. What was really weird about this, the first thing on this farm, this guy wanted to show us his, his, his favorite bird. And then we walked in to look at the baby chicks. So be careful from where you drink, okay? This was a, a broiler house we visited, and this was kind of neat in a way. We walked into this broiler house, and we noticed that it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. It was cool outside, so I can't say it was hot, but these birds were just 
attacking the nipple drinkers. It's click, 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 click. They weren't going after the feed. They weren't panting, but they're just really going after the water. So when you see something like that, what, what do you think? But no water, right? So we ask, because a lot of times, you know, the people will have, the birds will have no water. They know you're coming. They figure it out, turn it on. All the birds are attacking the drinkers. You know something's not right. Or they'll just say, oh, we just water vaccinated. And then the birds are thirsty, which we know wasn't true. So we wanted to figure out why these birds were so interested in, in the drinkers. The water was turned on. The water pressure was correct. So why did these birds want water so much? Why, why, why were they so thirsty? So we started doing some investigation. The birds were just crowded around the drinkers. Well, we took one of the nipples off, and this is what came out of the line. This is what the drink, this is what the water line was filled with. Now, on this farm here, they had a checklist. Before birds are brought to the farm, the day before, the veterinarian goes off and he checks off everything. And on the, on the checkoff list was, was water line descaled? Check. Was water line shocked with chlor chlorine? Check. And here's birds that are 10 or 12 days old. I, I don't think that happened. This didn't happen from, one, from 10 or 12 days. And can you imagine baby chicks drinking water like this? This is what comes out of the water line. If you wonder why the birds were so thirsty was this, see the slime over the inside of the nipple? So the, the water was there, the water pressure was there, the birds were drinking, you could barely get any water because the, the, the nipple was blocked up. So this is, you know, this is, this is informed common sense. Contaminated water, birds have diarrhea, slow growth, they can't get enough to drink, and there's problems. This is what came out the end of the water line. So this was supposedly checked off as being cleaned. Okay, this right here just shows that oftentimes we walk into a house and the litter looks very nice. But if you go in there and, and kick the litter around, you see a lot, a lot of mold. So you're, you're putting your chicks on, on mold. Because what, what is the first thing the chicks do when they get to the house? They start, they start scratching, start digging. And they'll, 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 be, they'll breathe this in as young chicks. And you can have some serious problems. And here it was even worse, where the feed was all over the litter, alo along with the aspergillosis in the litter. So this was litter that, that was probably wet. They brought it in. They probably tried to dry it off, at least on the surface. And they didn't realize that they had a disaster waiting for those birds to come. OK, this is, is a vaccine crew here we came across. They, they were fowl pox vaccinating and also big trimming. And I'll never forget this because, I mean, you can tell these guys, they like their job, don't they? I mean, they're, they're, they're very happy at what they're doing, but when you look closer at what they're doing, you're just in shock. Okay, here you see the, a little can here with an ice cube. There's your vaccine vial, and there, there's the vaccinator. Here's your, here's your vaccine needles. Okay, so in other words, I guess if you can't relate to this, let's just say you go to the doctor's office today to, to, to get blood drawn. If the doctor reaches into the table and pulls a needle out of the table and says, put your arm out, are you, are you gonna do that? Well, this is the equivalent here. Now, when we were there, the veterinarian started yelling at these workers. And I told the veterinarian, I said, don't yell at them, you're responsible. You know, you're responsible for training these people, for, for doing audits, to make sure they know what they're doing. You know, you're the one that's trained and, and, and how, to, how to do this. So it's a veterinarian's job to make sure these, are, these things are being done correctly. If you inject a contaminated vaccine, you'll get a big abscess like this. You know, this was a killed injection given to a pullet at about 16, 17 weeks. Two weeks later, these birds went off feed, were depressed, and we opened these birds up, and, and they ruined these birds with a contaminated, killed vaccine in the breast muscle. Okay, this was an interesting farm here. You see a couple things here interesting. Here's his security dogs, he called them. He has, he has his, his aviary up here. You know, we say, you know, no birds on the, no contact with birds and no birds on the farm if you're gonna raise commercial chickens. You cannot, even the workers that come onto the farm should not have contact with commercial birds. 
But he had, he had aviary here. He was very proud of. He was breeding these little parakeets. And then he had these dogs, lots of dogs around there. He called them security dogs. But the dog never woke up the entire time we were there. So I really don't know what, maybe he was on nighttime watch or something, but, but he didn't seem too concerned about us. Okay, as I mentioned, he had lots of dogs around. We walked out of the house with the dead chickens and I had like five of them in my hand when I walked out. It was greeted with the dog pack that, that, that took almost all of them except one. But he had dogs everywhere. And what you could tell was when chickens died, he just threw them outside and they conveniently disappeared. So he had all these dogs running around, which is also a pretty important disease carrier. Well, what's interesting about this slide? You see the blackbirds, you see the egrets. You know, this was like visiting a botanical garden. He had so many different species of birds in that house. And it was sad because the blackbirds and the egrets were very healthy. All the commercial broilers were very sick. They all had mycoplasma and respiratory disease. So keeping wild birds out is, is critical for commercial broiler production. Okay, this slide right here is shown, and this, this is a broiler house fairly high up in the mountainous area, fairly cool. So they didn't really have any real need for a lot of, lot of heavy ventilation. But I show this slide for a different reason in, as relates to biosecurity. You know, when you think of ventilation as what? As a way to cool the birds, right? But ventilation also has another very important role for diseases. You know, if, if the animals are sick and you have a good wind movement through the house, it removes that bacteria or virus from the house very quickly. If you don't have ventilation, you don't get the dilution. An animal sneezes and all that virus just comes down and sets down among all the other chickens. So even if you're in an area where it's cool, you still want to have air movement to, to dilute out the ammonia, the dust, and the bacteria, viruses, molds, and everything else. So we always say what, that ventilation, you know, dilution is a solution for pollution. Well, it also applies to um, diseases. His company, very interestingly, had birds in a flat, hot area where they had tunnel ventilation, and they had these birds up in the mountain where, was, where the temperature was ideal. The birds in the hot, flat area were very healthy. Birds from the same company up in the mountains here had a lot of respiratory disease. So that just shows you that you know, if you don't ventilate, don't move air, get rid of ammonia, get rid of humidity, get rid of heat, get rid of diseases. It's all important. This was a picture from somebody in Florida, one of our geniuses in Florida, who decided to, to ventilate the poultry house. And he wanted to show me his, his, his idea. I think it was, this is a fan here. And you look at this and you, 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 know, this, you say a picture is worth a million words. Well, this is definitely the case. Look at the wire. You know, the air, could, air, like air could barely move through the, through the wire because it was so, so clogged up with debris. If he would just clean the wire once in a while, he would have had a lot of air. So, you know, so, so allow, take advantage. If you have open-sided houses, open your curtains to get the air in. Keep your wire clean so air can move through. Remove any obstructions. I think we all know what happens when we see this. What, what does this mean? You look at, here, here's a heater, and here's birds, here's a heater, here's birds, here's a heater, here's birds. So this is, means the house is too cold. And if the house is too cold, what happens? Well, we know these, these birds in the middle there, if it's cold, are not going to get up, climb over everybody, go out to an area that's cold, eat and drink and come back. They're, they're not going to do that very often. So your seven-day body weights will be low, and you'll have terrible uniformity. So you have to you know, make sure that the house is properly heated. Okay, here's another one here. See if you can figure this one out. This was an interesting one. Um, I, I walked into this house and of course the, the body weights were bad, the uniformity was bad, but just look at the behavior of these birds and tell me if you can figure out what is right or wrong. To give you a clue, this, this was a poultry farm in Russia. Pardon me? Okay, the, the, I took my thermometer, the air temperature was correct. 
What, what would make birds behave this way? I mean, do they really? This is a, a pan feeder here. Do they really like to feed that much? I don't, I don't think so. They weren't eating. The, the, the floor temperature. Yeah. In other words, over there, you know, it's very, very cold. So they, they turned the heaters on just maybe six hours before the birds arrived. The air temperature was warm, but the floor temperature was still 20 to 25 degrees below what it should be. And what happens when it's cold on the ground? They get off the ground. They're, doing, they, they're on top of the feeders, on top of these feeders. They're getting off the ground. And again, these birds are not eating and drinking. They're just trying to survive. And I remember that in Fahrenheit, the temperature on the floor was like 62 degrees Fahrenheit. The air temperature was about 90. So in other words, they needed to turn the heaters on much longer in that country because of the cold floors. Now, in this part of the world, that's not a problem. I mean, we, we don't have a problem with the floors. This speaks for itself. You know, you feed, escaping outside the house, you get rodents, you, you get flies, you get all kinds of pests that carry disease. This was from my state of Florida. Um, this is another, another one right here. We'll go over and see if anybody can figure it out. <coughs> Visited this farm. The farmer was, was, was very angry at the company saying, you're sending us terrible chicks. You're sending us terrible feed. My seven-day body weights are terrible. My uniformity is terrible. Can you kind of see what's going on here? It took me a long time. Let's look a little closer. It's kind of strange that the birds were around certain drinkers, but others they weren't. And if you look, if you look here, if you look here, you know, birds are not here, but they're there. Not here, but they're there. Same thing over here. No birds, birds. No birds, birds. What is going on here? Well, what's missing? Pardon me? The water's not hanging. Well, how come if the water's not hanging that the birds want it? Look at that. This one's not hanging, but, but the birds want that one. What, what, what crazy thing was this guy doing? Pardon me? Well, it's, well, basically what he did here, see right here? They have water, nobody cares. The rest of the birds are fighting here. What he did is he unhooked up every other water and put feet in it. And what happens, basically, you have all these birds here. A couple birds can eat at a time. They're all fighting to eat. But you look at the rest of the birds. They've just given up. They're not going to make it to the feeder. So basically, the bottom line was feeder space, drinker space. How much are we supposed to have? Is the feeder space and water space in a comfort zone area where the birds will go out to? This guy right here was yelling at the, at the, at the feed, feed company. He was yelling at the chick supplier. Everything was bad. But we knew that chicks and feed going to other farms in the area were doing great. But this was a guy who, I don't know why he did this, but there was not enough feeder space. But if you look back now, you can kind of see it. There's no feed here, no, no feed anywhere, except in a couple drinkers. Okay, we're toward the end here. What's, what's wrong with, with this slide? This is, a, this is a water line that goes into a brother house. When they want to add vaccines or anything else, they shut this down. They pass the water through here, through a dosatron to add in the vaccine or the antibiotic or whatever. Then the water goes through here and goes back into the house. Pardon me? Exactly. Well, the answer was the filter's in the wrong place. Okay. In other words, what he's doing here is, is water's coming in. He's diverting the water down here, adding the vaccine. Water's coming up here. He's taking out the vaccine. And then, and then the water goes into the house. And his complaint was, we've tried many different vaccines. We can't get any, any reaction to the vaccines. We can't get any response. They had the, the filter at the wrong place. This is, again, not rocket. My, my son's an aeronautical engineer, and he always tells me, his job is rocket science, mine is not. And I think he's right. This is not rocket science. This is informed common sense. Think. 
Okay. And this slide right here, I'm just showing for the purpose to demonstrate to you that, you know, in many cases, when you have a problem with production, it's not an infectious disease. Um, I know from my experiences working in my state with the layer industry, we get calls all the time where there's a three or four percent drop in egg production, and at least half of the time, we find out it's because the egg belt's broken and there's about 10,000 eggs under the cages. Not an infectious disease. So we have to always keep our mind open. So I guess in summary, the development of an infectious disease depends upon three variables. One is the resistance of the bird. Now with the resistance of the bird, we keep that up by providing a low stress environment. We also use, correctly use vaccines to get good immunity. We have some control over that. Another, another variable is the virulence of the organism. Is the organism a hot organism or is it a mild organism? And of course, we don't really have much control over that. The third variable on whether or not an infectious disease hap happens is the dosage. And this is where biosecurity plays a role. Our objective is to keep the diseases out or at least reduce the amount of disease that can enter the farm. You know, diseases that occur in chickens are often dose dependent. They get a high dose, it's a serious disease. They get a low dose, often their body can fight it off and actually prevent the disease. Okay, okay again, I get the end here. I'd like to thank Champrix for supporting my travel to the meeting and I um, appreciate you taking your time to, to attend. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Butcher. Um, just a few takeaways before we go to lunch on Dr. Butcher's presentation. Um, I think that his presentation was very funny at times. <laughs> absolutely serious topic, however, um, because biosecurity is an absolutely important thing that we must never forget about. And he said, I think one of the most important things that he talked about was the, 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 the owner of the farm that brought a visitor in and because he's the only, he didn't adhere to the rules. So rules must be, be followed by everyone, no matter who it is. Um, as you could see, the presentation transcended not just about dealing with, with disease management and control, but he also showed again, once again, that management generally, um, just starting the baby chicks off well, and uh, right equipment, right heat, right temperature, right, right housing, right management is important to defend against disease threats and prevalences. So we'll have lunch now. We smack bang on target, so we know at 12 o'clock. So lunch will be one hour, we we'll start at one. Um, I would like to suggest that everyone to come back because we have two more presentations to be done. Very important because those deal with one, the future of our industry, at least in Guyana, which is for the processing. And, uh, and the other one deals with a very important thing that Dr. Dr. Ali will be speaking about, which is the threats to the industry generally from near and far. So have a good lunch. Lunch is downstairs just straight below us, and every, see you everyone at one.